I have a simple thought experiment for you, as always. Can you imagine you're walking down the street in the middle of the night and you're approached by a stranger? Um, you can pick one of those two strangers, uh, photos will appear on the screen, and you can pick only one that you can help. Which one would you choose? Just write in the comments down below. If you chose a handsome young hipster on the left side, prepare for a disaster. That is no other than infamous Josef Stalin, who is indirectly responsible for more than 20 million deaths during his brutal regime, of which 1 million people died in gulags in notorious labor camps. On the other side is not your annoying neighbor telling you to turn down the music, but rather Jose Pepe Muica, known as the humblest president of the world and ex-president of Uruguay. If you help the first one, you would probably not end up at the jazz party where you can buy vinyl records, but maybe in jail without any food. And if you help this grandpa, you would probably be invited to his farm in Uruguay, feasting on organic vegetables from his garden and listening to tango music. Well, they both dabbled in Marxism, but with quite different outcomes. But all kidding aside, why do we humans tend to believe beautiful or attractive people more? Why do we find attractive people more morally superior or good or, uh, you know, trust their opinions or even trust them when they recommend us facial cream? We will need to consult cutting-edge science and take a deeper dive into history of humanity and art to get to the core of this very problem. Because this is Fabric of Life and I'm your host Vladislav Radek. I'm writer and mathematician on a quest to uh, merge art and science to answer questions that were never answered before. In this episode we will try to answer the question that is not posed so often, but it should. Why do we believe beautiful people more? Let me take you on an adventure. Since the beginning of our time, we humans tend to associate beauty with goodness. Even philosophers like Socrates and Kant made this connection, and classical art that is now hanging in most of our museums tend to represent goodness as youthful, young, beautiful faces and those with green masses as bad and evil. But if you're too young to hang out with Socrates or great museums are too far, the classical novel The Picture of Dorian Gray will do. In this novel, realizing that his beautiful fate, Dorian Gray sells his soul so that he can stay forever young and beautiful, soon realizing that with his pleasant looks he can get away with anything. The prevalence of the assumption that beautiful people are good has been studied for the past few decades, with extensive research on the subject going back to 1970s. The research shows that people are more likely to assume a beautiful stranger possesses traits like warmth, sincerity and generosity. The good-looking are also presumed to be more intelligent, saner, more sociable and generally higher functioning. This phenomenon is called beauty bias and scientific findings don't stop there. Studies show that you're more likely to get hired if you're well groomed, that good looking people make about 12% more money than less appealing folks and that attractive real estate brokers bring in more money than their less attractive peers. We all suffer from halo effect without realizing it, we take someone's appearance to be telling of their overall character. Experiments have shown that we consider attractive people as more sociable, dominant, sexually warm, mentally healthy, intelligent and socially skilled than unattractive people. By the time cute kids become attractive adults, they're benefited from this bias for years, giving them higher level of confidence. So kids who are perceived more attractive at early stages of life actually gain more confidence in their childhood and then they use their confidence later in life, which makes them even more attractive because we know confidence is a 
are really attractive and then they create so-called hollow effect of beauty bias. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, say information scientist Marcus Mobius and Tanya Rosenblatt. Teachers expect better looking kids to outperform in school and devote more attention to children who are perceived to have greater potential. Mobius and Rosenblatt wrote in their 2005 paper Why Beauty Matters. Beauty bias is like racism, but it has much more shades and it's virtually impossible to spot. We are also trained since our early age by beauty biases. Here are some of the examples. Good-looking people are likely to be hired to read the news on the TV screen. They are selling us beauty products and attractive people are more likely to get elected to public office. The most important lines in the history of cinema were vocalized by people way more attractive than we are and they stay etched in our brains forever. It wasn't really all bad. I think he just craved a little affection. You know, a sense of being loved and needed and wanted. That's a very interesting point of view. <laughs> and before you say, oh, I would never judge somebody by the way they look, this study suggests that you're probably doing it very quickly and not being fully aware of it. A study recently published in the Journal of Nonverbal Behavior took a closer look at which traits we associate with beauty, shedding a light on why we possess the beauty bias. To carry out the study, the authors asked participants to look at images of faces and then had them decide whether the person possesses a given trait such as being sympathetic or generous to a greater or lesser degree than the average person. This study differed from previous studies because it not only looked if people associate good traits with attractiveness, because from previous studies we already know they do, but which type of traits they associate with which appearance. The first part of the test focused on purely moral traits such as being fair, trustworthy or honest, while the second part examined positive but non-moral traits such as being funny, organized or calm. The first test previously used in 2004 study when asking the question and involved 504 participants who looked at either six images of attractive people or six images of unattractive people. The participants were then asked to rate how likely it was that the depicted person had more of a given trait than the average person. And the second test included 756 participants with slight twist. They actually made it in a different language to make sure that the results from the first test are not tied to exact terms. The results of both tests lined up with previous studies showing that people associate beauty with all manner of positive traits. However, the recent tests shed new light on which traits are mostly affected by the halo effects that good looks provide. In both studies, moral traits were more likely to be associated with beauty than non-moral traits. The effect was particularly notable in the second study, in which beautiful people were 20% more likely to be perceived to have these traits than the average person, compared only to 10% increase in the perceived likelihood they would have the non-moral traits. Okay, we know that beauty standards shifted over the centuries. Just take a look at this statue of Venus of Willendorf. It's hard to imagine her having 1 million followers on Insta today, but 30,000 years ago she was a real influencer. Beauty standards depend on your culture, race, ethnicity and social economic background. Beauty bias is almost impossible to fight, but maybe we should start with standard practice of sending resumes without a photo or trusting doctors and not celebrities when it comes to our skincare. Working from home also made some shifts in that regard because some really attractive people now need to show their work without using their confidence. In the meantime, you should think about the following. Do you really trust me on this topic because you find me attractive or you really distrust me because you find me unappealing? Would you stay until the very end of this episode if somebody else was sitting in this chair or if nobody was sitting at all? What if I am just your illusion? What if life is just a dream? 
or simulation. Or maybe I'm just a voice inside your head. Maybe life is simulation and this is exactly one of the next topics of this show, Fabric of Life, and this is why you need to subscribe to this channel not to miss any of our future episodes. Until next week, stay tuned and curious, and don't forget, libraries still exist.